Okay, can I have the names of the part, uh, the last names of the attorneys, please? I just need it to, for the, the ballot that we have to fill out. Yes, Your Honor, we'll be representing the government today, and my last name is Lakaraji. That's okay. spelled L-A-K-K-A-R-A-J-U. Right, and you're Waylon? Yes. Okay, got it. So now all of us that are judging, we can put that in on our ballot. and then we're just going to get right to it here. So let me ask a procedural question here. This is just off the record and informal. So in an ordinary trial, the prosecution would give a closing and then there would be the defense uh, closing argument and then a rebuttal. Is that the format here? Yes. Okay, so two closing arguments for the prosecution and one for the uh, defense. Yeah. That is correct. And for this competition, we don't have to reserve time in advance for that rebuttal. Okay. It's just automatically at whatever time. I've time done different mock trials and they just <laughs> at different rules. Okay. Now it looks like we have everyone here. So um, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone. This is, uh, the court is now calling the case of U.S. versus Augie Shepard. Could I please have appearances by the parties? Yes, Your Honor, first appearances from the government. My name is Rita Lakarajan, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Ms. Sarah DeLacy. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Yes, may I have your appearance, please? Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Madeline Wayland, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Ms. Elena Young. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Uh, are both sides ready to proceed? We just have a couple of uh, preliminary okay. matters that we'd like to take care of first, Your Honor. Go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. First, we'd just like to invoke Rule 603 and 615 for the constructive pre-swearing and sequestration of all witnesses. Okay, that will be granted. We will assume that the witnesses are sworn and we'll do a constructive uh, uh, sequestration. Yes, Your Honor. We'd also like the court to note that there are a number of expert reports and uh, witness statements that both parties have stipulated prior to trial are admissible uh, without objection at any time today. Uh, those are Exhibits 3, 4, five and six. And Your Honor, we'd like to move those into evidence and tender them to the jury at this time. 
All right, so the, pursuant to the stipulation, those uh, exhibits, three, four, five, and six, they're expert reports, I understand. Uh, they're, I'm just sure, Your Honor, of expert reports, but also some uh, affidavits from lay witnesses. All right, those will be admitted into evidence, and uh, the jury will be able to review those during their deliberation. Continue yes, if you Honor. have anything else. We just have one last thing, Your Honor. Since we've never been in your courtroom before, we'd like to ask for your preferences in this trial. Would you like us to ask permission before approaching uh, counsel, the bench, and the jury, and the witness stand as well? No. Yes, Your Honor. With that, we're ready for opening statements. All right. Do you have anything you'd like to bring up before we get started on the trial? No, Your Honor. Defense is ready to get started. All right. Good. Now, let me ask the defense. Uh, in many situations, the defense saves their opening statement for the end of the prosecution case and the beginning of the defense. Is that your plan today, or do you plan to uh, make an opening statement right after the prosecution? Uh, those are not the rules of our jurisdiction. We'll be making our opening right after Ms. Long. All right, yeah, I practiced in state court. All <laughs> right, you may proceed with your opening statement. And I am going to, just to keep this moving and to help all of our judges and our evaluators here, we will take a brief pause uh, to make sure that we can enter our uh, evaluations at the end of each section. Otherwise, uh, with everything that's going on, it can get away from you. So we'll do that. Just take less than a minute at the end of each section. So go ahead with your opening, please. Your Honor, Ms. Whalen, members of the jury, he took a deal. So the defendant took his life. October of 2018. And a man named Barry Cacallo is testifying in a courtroom. Members of the jury are going to hear that Mr. Cacallo was facing years in prison. But he has a way out. You're going to hear that the government is offering a deal. A deal to testify against the mafia in exchange for spending the rest of his life in witness protection. Members of the jury will learn today that Mr. Capello took that. He stood up in court, told the truth. But you'll learn that our story it doesn't end there. Because members of the jury are going to hear that three years later, Mr. Capello was found murdered, strangled to that right outside his own home. You're going to hear it's because Mr. Capello took that deal. So this defendant took his life. And members of the jury today, you're going to hear that the defendant in this case, Augie Shepard, he's the leader of an organized crime, the same group that Mr. Capello testified against. And members of the jury are going to hear that when the defendant closed, what Mr. Capello had to say about it. When he heard that Mr. Capello exposed the defendant as the leader of that crime ring, this defendant wanted revenge. And you're going to hear that in June of 2021, that's exactly what he got. You're going to hear that when the defendant found Mr. Capello in witness protection, he took action. You're going to hear that after Mr. Capello took that deal, the defendant, took his life. That's why we charged the defendant with murder and witness retaliation. Not only that we had to prove that the defendant killed Mr. Capello, and he did that because of that trial that Mr. Capello testified in back in 2018. Members of the jury, we have to prove those two things to you today beyond a reasonable doubt. We know that's a high burden. But it's one that we're going to be. And to me, we're going to tell you about the deal that Mr. Capello took and how the defendant was the man who took his life. So first, that deal. Because members of the jury today are going to hear that after Mr. Capello testified in that trial in 2018, he was moved all the way into witness protection. A U.S. Marshal is going to testify today and tell you that he was moved across the country all the way to Los Angeles. Did you hear how he was given a new name, a new identity, a new life? And you're 
going to hear that in June of 2021, the defendant found Mr. Patel. And not just hours later, Mr. Patel was murdered. But members of the jury are also going to hear how this defendant was the man who took his life. Because they are going to hear a lot about what the defendant looks like and what kind of car he drives. You're going to hear that the defendant, in this case, he's a white man, 5'10", 180 pounds, drives a green Ferrari, and he has size 11 shoes. And you're also going to hear that the man who killed Mr. Capello, he was a white man, 5'10", 180 pounds, size 11 shoes, and the night Mr. Capello drove, he drove a green sports car all the way to Mr. Capello's house. You're going to hear how he waited for Mr. Capello to leave. And members of the jury are going to hear how filled with rage, that night, grabbed a set of jumper cables, wrapped it around Mr. Capello's neck, and he pulled and pulled until Mr. Capello couldn't breathe. And with the jury for the rest of this trial, I want you to pay very close attention to the deal Mr. Capello made and the descriptions of the man who killed him three years later. Because if you do, confident that you'll see that after Mr. Capello took that deal, this defendant was the man who took his life. That's why at the end of this trial, I'm going to come back up here again and ask you to find the defendant guilty. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. You may proceed with your opening statement at this time. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, members of the jury. Now this morning, there was a boy who woke up to an empty house. You see, all his belongings were there, but not the things that really made it home. His father was gone. He's haunted by a memory of seeing his father ripped from his home, shoved into the back of a police car with his hands behind his back. Now you're actually going to get to meet that boy today. And his father? Well, that's the person the government just called the defendant over and over. But he has a name. It's Augie Shepard. And I want to remind you that when Mr. Shepard came into this courtroom today, he was presumed innocent. Now, I know that can be a hard thing to ask after you just heard all the government's accusations. Because I'll be honest with you, members of the jury, you're going to hear about the mafia, you're going to hear about the mob, because we agree that there was someone who had a deal and testified against Mr. Shepard. But what Ms. Lockeraju left out of her opening statement, what she didn't tell you about that deal, is that Mr. Capello did it to remove a lengthy prison sentence. But even if we could trust what Mr. Capello said in that trial, Mr. Shepard is still entitled to the same presumption. Because what the government accuses in their opening statement, it's not the law. Because the judge is going to tell you that Mr. Shepard is presumed innocent until the government proves everything they just told you beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the highest burden in our legal system. And it's not one they're going to be able to meet. To show you how they're not going to be able to meet it, I want you to remember two questions throughout today's trial. Two questions that I'm confident will make it clear. That the government only saw what they wanted to see. So first, where did those jumper cables come from? Because the government, they told you a lot about those jumper cables in their opening statement, but I noticed they left one thing out. That those jumper cables belonged to a car that 18 different people had access to. And not the car company and not the police could tell you when those cables went missing from that car. 
So now for that second question, where is their eyewitness? Because the government, they have an eyewitness that they claim saw the murder happen. So you may expect that this person would take the stand today. wonder if that's because they have something to hide. Because you see, when you actually listen to the government's story today, you're going to see that that eyewitness contradicts other evidence in the investigation. And you're going to learn that the police never looked in to that discrepancy. discrepancy. Now, I understand why the government Someone died, and they're just trying to find the person responsible. I want that, too. And look, it's not easy for me to stand up here and say that I don't know who killed Barry Capello. It's hard for me to not have an answer for you. But what I do know is that sending an innocent man to jail, that is injustice. When a boy goes home without his father, our legal system failed him. Because members of the jury today, you're going to see that the government only saw what they wanted to see. But today, we can see everything the government chose not to. We can see the holes in their case, and I am confident that at the end of this trial, you will see. Why well, I'm going to ask you to find Audie Shepard not guilty. Thank you for your time. Thank you, counsel. Now at this time, we'll mark our ballots for the opening statement. All right, are you prepared to call your first witness? Yes, Your Honor, the government calls Connor Wright. All right, can uh, that witness please take the stand and you are presumed to have been sworn. Yes, Your Honor. As soon as the witness is seated, you may proceed. Yes, Your Honor. So just a bit of housekeeping for our evaluators. We'll be uh, entering the next two scores at the end of the defense case before the closing argument starts. Go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. Could you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Good morning. U.S. Marshal Connor Wright, Natural Service. And sir, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do for a living? Of course. I work with the federal government in witness protection. Sir, I think I hear a little bit of an accent. Can you tell us where you're from? I am from the United States, but for most of my career I was stationed in Europe, headquarters in the London office. Uh, can't tell you much about my background there, but let's just say that by the time I left, the Soviet Union wasn't a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that you're a U.S. Marshal where the FBI got to come from. It's my wife's jacket. Uh, in my rush to the courtroom today, I accidentally grabbed the wrong jacket. So she's currently at her office laughing about me with her friends. All right, sir. Well, tell us a little more about what you do as a U.S. Marshal. Of course. So as I said, I work in the Witness Protection Program. I relocate witnesses who need to be protected. I make sure they have new identities, new jobs, new locations, so they can't be found. Do you have any specialized training to do that kind of work? Yes, ma'am. I completed the mandatory 19-week federal training course. I've also got a degree in criminal justice, and I've been a deputy marshal for a while. Sir, in all your time working as a U.S. Marshal, have you ever met someone named Barry Capello? Yes, I have. When did you meet him? I met him in 2018 after he testified. And can you tell us more about why you met him back in 2018? Yes. So in 2018, Mr. Capello testified against a prominent mafia organization in the country. And that's why I relocated. Can you tell us a little bit more about what was said in that trial? Of course. Mr. Capello identified the head of that mafia, the defendant. Objection, Your Honor, to hearsay. Could you argue that for a moment, please? 
Yes, Your Honor. First, Your Honor, this information comes from a trial transcript. That's prior sworn testimony. The declarant in that trial transcript is the decedent, in this case, Barry Capello. So he's unavailable under Rule 804A, and like we said, it's prior sworn testimony, so it's not hearsay. What's your response? Yes, Your Honor, if they're taking this from the prior sworn testimony, then we don't have an objection to that testimony, but it needs to be brought into evidence, and this witness needs to be referring to the fact that they are talking about what was said in that transcript. And do you have a response to that? Yes, Your Honor. We're not going to be using this information to prove the contents of the trial transcript. We're just using it to talk about what was said, the fact that this defendant identified Barry Capello as the leader of this crime ring. We don't care whether or not that's actually true, so it's not necessary for us to enter the document into evidence. If I may? All right. Your Honor, the government absolutely cares if this is true. In their opening statement, they got up and said that one of their charges is retaliation against a witness, and that this person, Augie Shepard, was motivated because they were part of this mob and named as it. They absolutely need this in for the trial. All right. So the objection is sustained with you may go ahead and lay some foundation as to where the source of this information, that the objection at this point is sustained. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Sir, would you recognize a trial transcript of that testimony if I showed it to you now? I would, ma'am. Could you flip to that trial transcript and find it in front of you? Of course. Take it at 7. Just go ahead and let me know when you're there. I got it. Sir, do you recognize that document? I do. Can you describe it for the court? Yes. This is the sworn testimony of Mr. Capello in 2018. Does it look any different than since you last saw it? Not that I can see. Your Honor, at this time, the government moves to enter Exhibit 7. You move to what now? We move to enter Exhibit 7 in evidence, Your Honor. All right. Any objection? No objection. All right. It will be received. And, sir, can you tell us one more time exactly what was said in that trial? Yes. In this sworn testimony, Mr. Capello identified many members of that mafia, the chief of which was the head of that mafia, who he identified as the defendant. And, sir, what happened after that trial? After that trial, I relocated him to Los Angeles with a new identity, a new home, and a new job. How long was Mr. Capello in Los Angeles? He was there for about three years until he was killed. All right, sir, I want to shift gears and talk about that murder. Did you investigate Mr. Capello's death? I did. And can you tell us a little bit more about how Mr. Capello was killed? Yes, ma'am. According to the autopsy, Mr. Capello was strangled to death with some jumper cables. Can you tell us the exact date that he was killed? Yes. He was killed on the 26th of June, 2021. Sir, do you know the exact time that he was killed on that day? Yes, ma'am. He was killed between midnight and 1 a.m. on the 26th of June. So you said that you investigated his death. Were you able to identify any suspect? Yes. Our chief suspect in the investigation was the defendant. And why was the defendant your chief suspect? He was our chief suspect for three main reasons. A voicemail that we received just hours before Mr. Capello was killed, a car that was found at the scene, and an eyewitness description of the attack. All right, sir, I want to go through each of those three pieces of evidence one at a time. We'll start off with that voicemail. Would you recognize a transcript of that voicemail if I showed one to you now? I would. Could you go to Exhibit 14 in that binder, sir? Just go ahead and let me know when you're done. I got it. Sir, can you identify that document? Yes, ma'am. This is the voicemail I received just hours before Mr. Capello was killed. Does that transcript look any different than since you last saw it? It does not. Now our government moves to enter Exhibit 14 in evidence. Any objection? Hearsay. What's your response? Yes, Your Honor. This document is a voicemail that was left by the decedent, Barry Capello, and it's a present sense impression, so it's admissible under Rule 8031. What's your response to that? In order for this voicemail to qualify under present sense impression, we need to know that it was made during or immediately after the time of the incident that Mr. Capello is referring to, and this voicemail doesn't give any foundation to suggest that. Response? Yes. 
Your Honor, the voicemail in itself is the foundation to suggest that. The statement in the voicemail reads, if I may proffer, Your Honor. Yes. Call me when you get this. I think they found me. Augie Shepard just walked by my office window and we made eye contact. Your Honor, in this statement, the declarant says he just walked past his office window. He's explicitly recounting an event directly after receiving. If I may? Yes. Your Honor, what does the word just mean in this voicemail transcript? We don't know when this voicemail was received. We don't know when it was recorded. We don't know when Barry Capello alleges that they saw Augie Shepard. And without any of that, the word just, that, that doesn't do enough to make present sense impression. The objection is overruled. Proceed. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. And Your Honor, we'd just like to clarify, uh, may we move into the 14 and Yes, evidence? it's accepted into evidence. Sir, if I were to play that voicemail for you in court right now, do you think you'd be able to recognize it? Yes, uh, I wouldn't forget it. Ms. Lacey, can you play Exhibit 13 for us? Objection, Your Honor, to lack of foundation before that is played, if I may. I think that's what she's doing right now. Overrule. Go ahead, play it. Call me when you get this. Uh, I think they found me. All the shepherds just walked by the office window. We made eye contact. Sir, is that the same voicemail that you heard? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, the government moves to enter exhibit 13. Yes. No objection. We just asked that that voicemail was played constructively outside the earshot of the jury for the authentication purposes. There you go. We're going to accept that as uh, the premise, and that will be admitted. Number 13 is admitted. Yes, Your Honor. If it was played constructively outside the ears of the jury, may we play it again in yes. front of the jury just so they can hear yes, it? Yes, we may, but we'll just 13. assume that that happened. So yes, Your Honor. We appreciate going. that. We've heard it. Keep going. All right, sir. So when exactly did you receive that voicemail? I received it 12 hours before Mr. Capello was killed. Sir, that voicemail says that Mr. Capello made eye contact with the defendant. Do you have any idea if the defendant was in LA at the time that that voicemail was made? Yes, ma'am. We have travel records and receipts from the defendant's whereabouts that day that confirm he was in the area when this voicemail was sent. And to be clear, sir, how much time passed between that voicemail being sent and Mr. Capello's murder. Yes, ma'am. This voicemail was sent around 12.50, and so 12 hours later, Mr. Capello was killed uh, between midnight and 1 a.m. on the 26th. All right, sir, I want to go ahead and move on and talk about that car that you mentioned. What car were you referring to? Yes, ma'am. The car identified at the scene was a dark-colored sports car. Do you know what kind of car the defendant drives? Yes, the defendant drove a dark green sports car, a Ferrari, consistent with the description. So that brings us to that third piece of evidence, those descriptions you mentioned. How did you learn about the descriptions of the attacker that night? We have an eyewitness, ma'am, who identified the attacker at the scene of the crime. And what did that eyewitness say? He said that the attacker was 5 foot 10, that he was a white male, and that the attacker weighed about 180 pounds. Did the defendant match any of those descriptions to the best of your knowledge? Yes, ma'am. When we arrested the defendant, we measured him. He was 5 foot 10, 180 pounds, and a white male. Match was perfect. Sir, were you ever able to find any other identifying features of this attacker? Yes. At the scene, we found a footprint uh, near the house. It was size 11. You know what size shoes the defendant wears? Yes, ma'am. Size 11. So after conducting your investigation, sir, what did you do? After we had the voicemail, the description, the car, we arrested the defendant. Simply put, we got him. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, we have no further questions at this time. We'd just like to uh, ask permission to publish exhibit 7 and 14 to the jury. There are already Yes, that will be done, and you may proceed on your cross-examination. Good morning, Agent. Good morning. Now, you just talked to us a bit about Barry Capello's testimony in a trial a few years ago, right? Yes. And you told us a little bit about a deal that he had, true? That's right. We gave him a deal and relocated him to Los Angeles. Well, could you flip back to Exhibit 7, the transcript of that testimony? Of course, ma'am. Your Honor, this has already been admitted. Right. Okay. I got it. 
So I'd like to direct your attention to page 36, the last page of that transcript. Yes. Uh, lines 18, or 16, excuse me, to 19. That's when uh, the attorney asks what deal that Barry Capello is getting, true? That's right. And Barry Capello says, instead of getting prosecuted for a heroin distribution, I'm getting a new life in witness protection, right? Yes. Objection, Your Honor? Improper character evidence, might I be heard? Yes. Yes, Your Honor, Ms. Whalen is using evidence of prior bad acts to, uh, as improper character evidence against Mr. Capello. Can you respond, please? Yes, Your Honor, any witness's credibility may be attacked for truthfulness, and this is going to attack Mr. Capello's character for truthfulness. All right, response, response. Yes, Your Honor, in order for Ms. Whalen to use this evidence to prove truthfulness or untruthfulness of Mr. Capello, she has to lay foundation that the crime was a felony over 10 years ago. So then, Your Honor, I shift my grounds to lack foundation. If I may? Yes. We're not going to use this felony as uh, proof of the untruthfulness we are alleging. That can even be removed from the record. What we are going to show is that this witness was incentivized by a deal. It's going to show tr untruthfulness. So you're saying bias? Yes. Response, Your Honor? Yes, briefly. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. Additionally, for Ms. Whalen to use it for that purpose, she still has to meet the 403 balancing test. The evidence that she is citing still cannot be substantially more prejudicial than it is probative. In this case, to hear that the decedent, Mr. Capello, was convicted or was at least offered a deal uh, for a drug possession crime. Your Honor, the nature of that crime is severely prejudicial. The jury hears it can be biased against the decedent. Overruled. Proceed. Yes, Your Honor. So, Agent, Mr. Capello said, instead of getting prosecuted for heroin distribution, I am getting a new life in witness protection. Isn't that right? Yes. Now, you also told us about an eyewitness that you had in this case, right? That's right. She was a neighbor of Mr. Capello's? Yes. I I'd like to walk through the timeline of what she saw. Now, she claims that she saw the murder happen, right? Yes. After she saw the murder happen, she claims that she went out to Barry Capello. That she, uh, she looked at the scene. Yeah. That she went out and looked at the scene. Yes. And then that she turned back to go and call the police. That's right. But then when she turned back around, she saw the police had already arrived. Yes. And this was at around 12.30 a.m., correct? That is correct. So, Agent, if she didn't call the police, who did? Ma'am, we, we don't have any records of that call. So you have no idea who called the police? Uh, no, ma'am. It wasn't a, a fact on this investigation. But actually, isn't it true that in your investigation, you told us that Mr. Capello's wife said she called the police? Uh, yes, ma'am. So you but did have knowledge of who called the police? No, ma'am. She said she was going to call the police. They had already arrived on the scene. So you don't have any records for the police phone call from Mr. Capello's dad? That's right. And you never investigated who called the police, right? No, nothing turned up in the investigation. So now I'd like to talk to you more about the evidence that you found at the scene of the crime. Now you said that you found a pair of jumper cables, true? That's right. And then that you investigated these jumper cables, correct? We found the jumper cables, yes. And you found that this type of jumper cable that you found, it, it wasn't rare, was it? Uh, no, ma'am. It was widely distributed. That's right. If I walked into a Walmart down the street, I could probably find one. Sure. If I looked it up on Amazon, I could probably find one, too. That's right. So you contacted the rental car company of Mr. Shepard, correct? Yes. And you'd recognize a copy of the letter they sent you in response, true? I would. Can you flip to Exhibit 10, please? Got it. Now, that is the letter that you received from Mr. Shepard's rental car company, true? It is. It looks to be a fair and accurate copy? Yes. Defense offers Exhibit 10. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right, it will be received. So in that letter, the rental car company tells you about the status of the car that Mr. Shepard rented, true? Uh, yes, that it was missing its jumper cables. But they told you a little bit more than that, didn't they? Uh, I'm not sure which part you're referring to. Sure, I'll make that clear. Well, they told you that 
this rental car with missing jumper cables, it had been rented by 18 people, right? That's right. Rented by 18 people in the last six months before Mr. Shepard rented it. Yes. And of those 18 people over the course of the last six months, you couldn't tell us who was renting the car when the cables went missing, could you? I can't give you their names, ma'am, no. Thank you for your time, Agent. I have nothing for you. All right, do you have any redirect? Briefly, Your Honor. Sir, Ms. Whalen just mentioned to you that in that document, Exhibit 10, a uh, car company said that jumper cables were missing. Was that significant to your investigation? Yes. Why? Well, jumper cables were found at the scene, and we confirmed that they were the murder weapon, the device used to strangle Mr. Capella. And the jumper cables missing from that rental car tied the defendant to that murder. Sir, can you just clarify for us one more time who rented the car in this agreement? Yes, ma'am. It was the defendant. That's all we have, Your Honor. We just ask for the excuse for any recross. Do you have any recross? No recross. All right. This witness may be excused. Thank you for your testimony. And Your Honor, may we publish a bit of time to the jury? Do what now? Wait, may we publish a bit of time to the jury? Yes. Yes. Just one more. Yes. Do you have any additional witnesses to call? We do not, Your Honor. We rest our case in chief. All right. Uh, the defense may proceed. I understand you have a witness to call. We do, Your Honor. At this time, we call Lauren Shepard. All right. So, Ms. Ms. Mr. Shepard, you can go ahead and take the stand, remembering that you have been sworn. You may proceed. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Could you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Shepard. Where are you from? Philadelphia. What do you do for a living? Right now, I'm a rising sophomore at Villanova. <coughs> do you know why you're here? I do. Um, I was with my dad on June 25th, 2021, the day that Barry Capello was killed. And I'm here to tell you what I know. Did you know Barry Capello? Yes, ma'am. How did you know him? He was a really good friend of my dad's. He used to come by the house a lot, like Thanksgivings, Christmases. We were close. I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. Mr. Shepard, I need to talk to you about that day you were with your dad, June 25th, 2021. Where were you? We were in Los Angeles. Um, we were doing some college visits in California that week. Uh, so that was the last one, UCLA. I'd like to take June 25th in two parts the day and the night. So starting with the day, what time did you arrive in Los Angeles? So we got in at like 10 o'clock in the morning, I think. What did you do after you got in? We went right to the hotel, put our stuff in the rooms, checked in. How long did you stay in the hotel? Not too long. Uh, we were hungry, so we went and got some lunch. Where did you go to lunch? We went to an Italian restaurant called Pomodoro's right near UCLA. Um, my friend had recommended it to us, and it was really good. Was Pomodoro's the only place you went on that lunch trip? No. Uh, we wanted to get some ice cream after, and there was a place right down the block, so we went to ice cream too. When you walked down the block to the ice cream shop, did you see a building called Klein Travel Agency? Yes, ma'am. It was, it was on the block right near the restaurant where we went. Did you look inside? The travel agency? Yes. Not that I can remember, no. Did you ever see your dad look inside? No, ma'am. Did you ever see Barry Capello? Uncle Barry? No, we did not. 
Did your dad ever tell you he saw Uncle Barry at that agency? No. So what did you do after you got lunch? So we got lunch, we got the ice cream, and then we went on a tour of UCLA. We got to walk around, uh, talk to some admissions people. It was really nice. Well, how long were you on that tour? Tour lasted for a while. We talked to the folks in the admissions office. I'd say we were on campus all together for like three or four hours. What did you do when you left campus? We went back to the hotel for a little bit just to change before dinner. At what time did you go to dinner? 7.30, I think. Uh, we went to a steakhouse. And then what time did you return to the hotel? Like 10.30 at night, I think. So that was a lot of things you did in one day. Uh, could you give us an idea of how many hours you were with your dad doing all those things on that day? I mean, we were on a trip together. It was the whole day, so more than 12 hours, maybe 15 hours from when we woke up to when he went to sleep. So I'd like to transition to the night of June 25th, after you got back from that dinner. Did you go anywhere else after that? I did. I, I went to a, a college party with my friend. Did your dad go with you? No, ma'am. Not to the college party. <laughs> so how long were you gone? I was out with my friend for maybe three hours, from like 11.30 to 3. And did you ever tell your dad that you were going? Uh, no, I, I was 17, um, and we were drinking, so I, I did not tell my dad. Did you ever, did you ever receive a call from your dad while you were gone? <laughs> no, thank God. Did you ever receive a text from your dad when you were gone? No, ma'am. So what was your dad doing when you left for that party at 11.30 p.m.? Oh, my dad was asleep when I left the room. Did you actually want to lack personal knowledge, may I be heard? Yes. Connor, I'm objecting specifically to Ms. Williams' question. What was the father doing when he left? If he was gone, we have no idea of, no, we have no way of knowing what the father was doing. Response? If I may, this isn't asking what happened after he left. It's asking what the dad was doing as he was sleeping at 11.30. All right, the objection is overruled. Go ahead. Um, when I left the hotel room, my dad was asleep in the bed. Objection, Connor, is speculation, may I be heard? Yes. Yes, Your Honor, we don't have a foundation on the record for how this witness knows his dad was sleeping. This witness hasn't described what he witnessed that night. He hasn't described the father's characteristics. We need a foundation on the record for him to form that opinion. Uh, the objection is sustained. Go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. How did you know your dad was asleep? Um, his eyes were closed and he was snoring. And how did he look when you got back at 3 a.m.? Same thing. He looked asleep. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. Cross-examination, please. Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? Yes. Go ahead. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm just going to be asking some questions today. I know it might be a little bit hard to testify, so if you need a break, then just go ahead and let me know, okay? I appreciate that. That's all right. Thank you. Sir, you know that your dad is on trial for murder, right? I do. Uh, it's, it's been really hard on our family. So you agree with me that you love your dad, right? I do. It's difficult for you to testify in his murder trial. This is all difficult. Truth. I want to tell you what I know. Sir, would you lie for me? Would I lie? No, ma'am. I would not lie. You actually did lie for him, though, didn't you? 
I did not lie for my father, no man. Well, sir, you were called being interviewed by the police, right? Yes. About this murder investigation? Yes. They asked you about your father's whereabouts the night of June 26th? They did. They asked you if you were with him the night of June 26th? They did. So let's talk about what you said, because at first, you told the police you were with your dad the entire night, true? Yes. That wasn't true, was it? No, not while I was at the party. <coughs> Sir, you lied. Well, I, I told the police that I was out from 11.30 to 3. Let's be clear, sir. When the police first interviewed you, you told them something that was not true, correct? First, I told them I was there the whole night, and then they, they showed me my Uber receipt, and I, I told them I had gone to the party where there was drinking. Well, hold on, sir. We're, we're going to get there in just a moment. First, you told them something that was not true, that you were there the entire night, correct? Yes, ma'am. Then they did not show you the Uber receipt, true? No, they did show me an Uber receipt. Actually, sir, they showed you text messages, right? Yes, text messages and an Uber receipt. First, they showed you the text messages, right? I, I think that was the order of it, yes. Sir, after they showed you those text messages, suddenly, you told them, you were actually missing for one hour that night, right? I believe that's what I said, yes. You were not with your father for one hour that night. Yes, ma'am, I told them I went to the party. That was not true either. That I went to the party? Sir, it's not true that you were missing for an hour, correct? No, I was gone from 11.30 to 3. So you lied to the police again? Yes, ma'am. And then, that is when they showed you those Uber receipts you mentioned, true? Yes. Then, sir, you changed your story again, right? I told them I was at the party from 11.30 to 3. That's right, sir. Now you told the police you're missing for four hours that night, right? Three and a half. All right, sir, you, made, you were missing for three and a half hours, right? That's what I just said, yes. That's three and a half hours you were not with your father that night. Yes, I was at the party. That is three and a half hours you cannot account for his whereabouts, true? I'm not sure. Sir, you weren't with him, right? No, I'm not sure what he was doing. You're drinking, you can't tell us what he was doing when you were not with him, true? No, he was asleep when I left, he was asleep when I got back. I don't know what happened while I was gone. All right, sir, let's talk about what might happen while you were gone. You agree with me that your dad knows Barry Capello, right? Uncle Barry? Yes, we, we all knew him. He was like family. He didn't like Barry Capello, did he? My dad? Uh, objection, Your Honor, to speculation. Response? Response? Yes, Your Honor, this witness has observed his father's relationship with the deceased Barry Capello for many years. He can testify based on his perception. What he knows. If he doesn't know, he can say it. Any it, response? Yes, Your Honor. The question as phrased, it doesn't lay any of that foundation. It's, it's merely asking for speculation at this point. Sustained. Yes, Your Honor. Sir, you know that Barry Capello testified against your family in a trial in 2018, correct? Against my father. That's right, sir. Against your dad. Yes, that's what I just said. Dad wasn't very happy about that, was he? No. Let's talk about all the things that he said after that happened. You agree with me? He appeared very upset to you. Yes. He appeared angry. Yes. After Barry Capello testified against your dad, your dad said Uncle Barry is a rat. True? Yes. He said, I never want to hear that rat's name again. Didn't he say that? Yes, ma'am. This was in 2018. Sir, he said, Barry Capello is dead to our family. Yes. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right, do you have any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. All right, proceed. Mr. Shepard, why did you initially tell the police that you weren't at a party? I, I didn't want to get caught. Were you lying for your dad? Absolutely not. Thank you for your time. Nothing further. And barring any recross, may Mr. Shepard step, step down. Any recross on that? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, this witness may be excused. Thank you for your testimony, sir.
At this time, we're going to take a moment and do and score a direct examination, cross exam, and objections, and the witnesses. So take a moment here. Okay, it looks like everybody's pretty much done. So at this time, we will have the closing argument by the prosecution. You may proceed. Yes, Your Honor. His store window 
on the streets of LA. The moment Mr. Capello was so afraid, and he said the words in Exhibit 13, Mr. Lacey, can we hear them again? Call your witness. I, I think they found on the shelf, just walked by my office window. We made eye contact. I think the jury, Mr. Capello, was right. He's so scared. Because after he said those words, he was murdered. is the person who took his life. How do we know? Because someone saw him doing it. I mean, just think. We have an eyewitness who saw this strangulation occur. Members of the jury, what did that eyewitness say? He said he saw a white man, 5'10", 180 pounds, drive a green car and strangle somebody on Mr. Capello's drive who we even know his shoe size. Size 11. And what did we coincidentally hear about the defendant? He's a white man, 5'10", 180 pounds, size 11 shoes, and he drives a green Ferrari. So members of the jury, what is our lesson? The same person who saw Mr. Capello right before he was murdered is the same person who has no alibi for the night of the murder is the same person who was witness at the scene of the crime, members of the jury, that is not a coincidence. On June 25th of 2021, this defendant saw Mr. Capella. 12 hours later, he was dead. He took a deal. So the defendant took his life. Find this defendant guilty. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. You may proceed. Do you remember the first thing the government told you? He took a deal, so Mr. Shepard took his life. Now, since the first time we heard her say that line, the government has repeated it over and over. She can say it. all she wants, members of the jury, but that line doesn't prove anything. And it certainly doesn't prove that Mr. Shepard killed Mr. Capella. Because one fact is clear. The government only saw what they wanted to see. But that's not to say we don't understand why the government is upset. Why they want justice for the man who lost his life. We want that too. But there's no justice in sending an innocent man to jail. That's why when the government walked through those doors today, the law placed a very heavy burden on their table. One that can't just be met with a catchy one line. They had to prove to you that Mr. Shepard intentionally killed Mr. Capello, and they had to prove that to you beyond a reasonable doubt. They failed to do that. To show you why, I want you to remember those two questions I asked you at the beginning of today's trial. So I'm going to answer them for them. So first, where did those jumper cables come from? We don't know. Because members of the jury, you could go walk down the street after this trial into a Walmart and pick up one of those same exact jumper cables for yourself. And it would look just like the murder weapon. And now the government wants you to think that these cables came from Mr. Shepard's rental car because they were missing, but, but they keep leaving out this key piece of evidence. Because you have this exhibit in front of you, the letter from the rental car company. It says that 18 people rented this car. So sure, that may make the defendant one out of 18, and maybe those are good odds if you're trying to enter the lottery, but we don't 
don't gamble on people's freedom, if you don't have moral certainty, So that brings me to the second question. Where is the government's eye with this? For all we know, they could be sitting at home. And actually, members of the jury have kind of lost track of how many different eyewitnesses they claim to have because there's the neighbor, there's Mr. Capello's wife, but then there's someone who called the police. Someone who had to call the police because the agent got up here and told you it, they have no phone records of who called that police and it wasn't the wife, it wasn't the neighbor, so who was it? I can't help but notice there's someone missing from this case. And what if, what if that person is a white man? 5'11", 180 pounds, size 11 shoe, driving a dark car. We'll never know. And you know why we'll never know? The agent told you himself, it wasn't relevant to my investigation to figure out who called the police. I was the truth. There is no more reasonable doubt than that. So now I want to take a minute to address the story that the government is telling you. Because they base their whole story off of Mr. Shepard having some motive to kill Mr. Capello because he was the leader of a mob, but I'll tell you why Mr. Capello said that in that trial, and that reason is in my hands. He took a deal, a deal that the government gave him, a deal that he would get his lengthy prison sentence removed for testifying against Mr. Shepard. But even if we could trust what Mr. Capello said, even if Mr. Shepard did have this motive, did he have any time? Because think about what the government is asking you to believe. We know that Mr. Shepard was with his son until 11.30 p.m. that night. And we know that the murder happened between 12 and 4. So what, members of the jury? Because we know that the son never saw Mr. Shepard looking through the yellow pages, looking online to see where Mr. Capello lived. So maybe he knew where Mr. Capello worked, but how would he know where he lived in all of the entire city of Los Angeles? And the only time he would have to figure that out is after his son left. So at 11.30, he scoured the entire city, found the exact house he wanted, took the jumper cables out of his car, drove there, murdered a man all in an hour? It doesn't make any sense. Still, when Mr. Shepard's son left, he never received any calls from his dad, never received any texts. So Mr. Shepard woke up expecting to see his son laying next to him, saw his son missing and didn't do anything? The government would have you believe that this is a person who would literally kill for his family, but when his own son was missing, he didn't do so much as pick up a phone? Frankly, members of the jury, that's absurd. That's absurd and that's reasonable doubt. Because the government only saw what they wanted to see, when they couldn't bring you facts that proved Mr. Shepard's guilt, they wanted you to presume it. But the law says that the only thing we can presume about Mr. Shepard is his innocence. So when the government can't tell you where those cables came from, he's presumed innocent. When the government can't even bring a single eyewitness that they had to this case, he's presumed innocent. When the government can't prove that he would have any means, motive, or opportunity to commit this crime, he's not even presumed innocent. He is. Thank you, counsel. Now let's have the rebuttal argument by the prosecution. Yes, Your Honor. First, could I just ask how much time I have? Mm -hmm. uh, I have one of the three. Thank you. <coughs> Max, 
Thank you, Council. Now let's go ahead and finish up our ballots and then we'll have uh, some time for some uh, comments from our evaluators. <laughs> 